we're looking at some logical and factual errors made by the authors of the book that we're reviewing in our lectureship, Muhammad Ali Akuli. The book is entitled The Truth About Jesus Christ, and but it's filled with logical and factual errors. And we just, uh, we've looked at several already, but we'll look at some more in this lesson. Time doesn't permit us to expose all of these errors, but we'll, therefore we're going to have to select a few and expose them, not all of them. Mohammed derived, the man that they call Mohammed the prophet, derived his view of the Bible from a corrupted version. There was a problem in the early church that occurred in the second century. It began to see parts of it. It was addressed by the Apostle John in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and I believe also in some other epistles, but those epistles particularly so, called Gnosticism. Gnosticism, and we don't have time to cover it, but the Gnostics changed the wording of the Bible and the doctrines of the Bible considerably. And Muhammad apparently came in contact with these people, and that was, it was where he got his view of Christianity. Uh, to some extent, there's evidence of that being the case. But whatever the case, he was uh, dealing with a corrupted form of, of the teachings of Christ. Akuli, I'll just refer to Akuli rather than, rather than Muhammad, because Muhammad Ali Akuli, if I just refer him to as Muhammad, you, we'd be confused with the, the man they call the prophet Muhammad. Akuli erroneously views the New Testament as both a political and religious system, but uh, because that's what Islam is, and he views Christianity in that way. And so his view of Christianity is wrong, and uh, it's not according to the scriptures at all. Because the Lord did not set up a physical kingdom upon the earth, as was established. He wrote in page 120 of his book, All the Diseases of the Western Civilization, have been flourishing under the umbrella of Christianity. See, that expression implies that Christianity ought to be controlling the political as well as the civil as well as the spiritual. And of course, uh, Islam does. With Sharia, it controls everything. It's a, it's a political and a religious system. Western imperialism of the third world uh, took place and so did racial discrimination under Christianity. Again, Christianity, I don't believe there's ever been a Christian nation. Uh, we are more, sometimes more in line with principles of, of the Bible, some nations are, than others. But uh, there's, n there's never been such a thing because the Lord never set up a political system for his people under the civil law. There is a system set up, a kingship of Jesus set up, but it's a spiritual kingdom. And so his confusion and uh, his confusion is based upon his misconception of the uh, nature of Christianity itself. That is, when I say Christianity, I'm talking about the biblical view of what the Bible teaches Christians should be. And then the word Christianity to the world encompasses everybody that claims to be a Christian. And there are some wild views being held by some of the religious groups that claim to be Christian. Uh, they they advocate many things. And so here on page 120, Akuli charges Christianity with a failure to police evil people. But it's not our job because the Lord didn't set us up as a civil kingdom. And uh, Islam does police people. Again, we point out that the Lord's kingdom is not a physical kingdom. John 18, 36 says this. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. So the kingdom that Jesus set up is not a physical kingdom, but not of this world, but it is a spiritual kingdom. And the man who asked him, Pontius Pilate, asked him this question in verse 35, uh, what have you done? And because the Jews have delivered you unto me, what have you done? Jesus replies, I've set up a spiritual kingdom. That's why they rejected me as king, because they wanted a physical king, 
and he didn't imp he didn't say that, but the implication is, if he had been a physical king, they would have would not have rejected him, and with, with his miraculous powers. Now, right here, when we see this, the kingdom of God is not a physical kingdom, and that's exactly the problem with many religious groups that are even claim to be Christian. Premillennialism has this problem. We had our last lectureship on that very subject. And so we have this problem. The Muslims view Christianity like they view their own system as a political and a and a religious system. It, because Islam is both. But the true Christianity of the Bible is not a political system. It doesn't have civil law. It tries to influence the government to enact laws that are just and fair and right, but it does not in invoke and does not have the authority to, to tell them what to do. As we look further, he went ahead and wrote, the Western society is threatened by alcohol, drugs, sex, crime, and anti-religiousness. These five diseases will inevitably be destroy the so-called Western civilization. My first reply is this. Muslims grow poppies to make heroin out of them and sell them to non-Muslims. This is evil committed by Muslims. So the Muslim society commits evil acts as well. So Islam has not controlled them. Islam has not stopped them from corrupting other people. That's evil. Islam further, Muslims engage in terrorist attacks. This is crime and murder. Furthermore, the Quran commands Muslims to wage warfare against all who are not Muslims. Surah 9.29 So, Islam has its hands dirty, but Islam is a civil system as well as religious. Christianity doesn't have its hands dirty when the, when the civil governments in which Christians, under which Christians are ruled do things that are evil. We're not responsible for their evil. But Islam is responsible because it is a civil system. See the difference? There's a big difference. And what we find here then is Christianity, true Christianity, Christianity of the Bible, is not a civil system. We don't control the civil government. We try to influence them, but we don't try to we don't control them. But Islam does. My fourth reply is Jesus the Christ, as we cited above forbade carnal warfare to spread his kingdom. His kingdom is not spread by carnal warfare, but Islam spread, spread its system by carnal warfare. Surah 929 says, in Yusuf Ali's translation of it, I have three different translations of the Quran, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, fight them. Nor hold them that, that forbidden which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger or acknowledge the truth of the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book. Now, the term people of the book in the Quran is people who take the Old or New Testament. People of the book would be Jews and Christians. Keep that in mind. That's their expression. Even if they are of the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and and feel themselves subdued. When they take over a place, non-Muslims have to pay a special tax for the privilege of just being able to worship. They have to pay a special tax. That includes that includes uh, those that are called Christians and the Jews as well. But they have to pay a special tax. So they are taxed extra in order to be have the privilege of just living in that Muslim state. And, of course, they have to submit to the laws of Syria, Sharia laws. But right here, he says, fight those who believe not in Allah or the last day, nor the last day, or hold that which forbid has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. His messenger would be Muhammad. And nor acknowledge the religion of truth, which would be Islam, even if they are of the people of the book, that is, Jews and Christians, until they pay that tax that extra tax that they have. Al-Quli admits that many of Western society have corrupted themselves. That is true. I agree with that. 
the Western societies reject religion and adopted secularism. But he says they have adopted secularism. In other words, they're not even trying to be Christians. Yet he wants to accuse Christians of wrongdoing when it's done by non-Christians because they expect us to have control of the civil government, which we don't. So we're not responsible for what non-Christians do. We try to influence them, try to convert them, try to make them into Christians where they won't do these things. But we're not responsible for their deeds. He still accuses Christianity of fostering these evils when the Bible condemns the very things that he accuses Christians of allowing. The Bible condemns all of the things he listed, as we read earlier. Now, Akuli does not seek out, as an honest truth seeker should, the pure religion of Jesus Christ. What he does is he looks at, at those that claim to be Christian that aren't following the Bible. And many of our religious neighbors don't follow the Bible. And that claim to be Christian, they don't follow the Bible. But Islam itself is divided into sects. Al-Quli Al is probably a Sunni. Most likely he is. I don't know that for a fact. And if I, if I accuse Islam of some of the strange practices of the Shiites, uh, he, would, he would object. You're not being fair. You're not being reasonable with us. Because we don't practice that. And I respond this way. We don't practice what some of the people that claim to be Christians practice. We don't practice that. And uh, one of the things is uh, a drunkenness, drinking, free divorce, and, uh, and so forth. There are religious groups that claim to be Christian that, that justify homosexual marriages. But we are against that. We don't believe that's true. We don't believe that's right. We believe it's sin. So you can't accuse me of advocating those things just because someone else who claims to be Christian advocates it. I'm not responsible for them. Now, Al-Quli is probably a Sunni. Let's go back, and if I accused Islam of some of the strange practices the Shiites practice, he would object, say, you're not being an honest truth seeker. And he would be right. But I don't accuse him of what they do. I accuse him of what the, what the Quran teaches, what it teaches. We'll expose what it teaches. The Shiites, and we're going to look at them just a bit here, and uh, they're a small group, probably about 15 to 20 percent of the, of the Muslims in the world are Shiites, but that's a significant number of millions of them are. The name Shia is derived from the word Shiat, Ali, meaning partisans of Ali. Now, Ali was the grandson of Muhammad. Shiites are devoted to martyrdom, rejection of formalism, they worship at the tombs of holy men, and they anticipate the coming of the Mahdi, which is someone who's going to deliver them and conquer the world. That's the Mahdi. And so they, that's what they teach. They perform passion plays, have mass processions to the tombs of the saints, and engage in self-flagellation. The Sunnis do none of these things. He is probably a Sunni. Akuli is. And I'm not accusing him of these things. And he, it would be wrong to accuse him if he's Sunni because he doesn't believe in those things. I don't believe in some of the things practiced by the Roman Catholic Church or by other groups that teach error that's contrary to the Bible. I teach what the Bible teaches, and I'm responsible for that. I'm only responsible for what the Bible, defending what the Bible teaches, not what someone else practices that's contrary to the Bible. I have no responsibility. He doesn't either. I won't accuse him of these things. But look at some of the self-flagellation. There's a subset of male Shiites injure themselves on Ashura to rep 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 represent their grief over the martyrdom of Hussein, grandson of the prophet, at the hands of the Yamad army in 680. That would be 680 AD. Now, they changed their calendar, so it won't be 680 in their calendar. Sunnis do not engage in self-flagellation. Keep this in mind. Some Shiites don't even engage in it. Now, the Shiites have a clergy laity system, but the Sunnis do not. You see, I don't accuse them of having a clergy laity because the Sunnis don't have it. The Shiite clergy are called imams. Only the Shiites have the imams. 
the Sunnis, the bulk of the Muslims, don't have an imam. They deem Ali to be the first imam. Now let's look at the Shiites claim their imams are divinely inspired and are infallible in their interpretation of the Quran. And they must obey the imam. That's that's the Shiites. But the Sunnis don't don't, don't follow that. They use Surah 570 and Surah 689 to justify the imam doctrine, but we will not, don't have time to look at their justification for that. They are religious groups. There are religious groups that claim to be Christians that don't follow the scriptures as their sole guide either. Our Roman Catholic friends don't follow the Bible as their sole guide. I've said and talked with Roman Catholic friends. They say, your problem is you, you just think the Bible is the only authority. We take the traditions of the church. So all of the changes that were made in the worship of the doctrine of the church, that was not in the Bible. Many of their practices are not found in the Bible. I'm not responsible for what they practice or teach or what they've done in the past, such as the, the uh, Spanish Inquisition. I'm not responsible for that. And what I teach is not responsible. Muslims wrongly view Christendom Christendom as monolithic, that is, one one system. They put all who claim to be Christians in the same category. But that's very convenient, but it's not honest. It's not fair. I won't char charge him with what the Shiites did, and if he won't charge me, and he shouldn't charge me with what, uh, with what the Roman Catholics did, did the Spanish Inquisition and other times. I'm not responsible for that. That was a deplorable, sinful, wicked thing to do. But look further. While attacking the doctrine of the largest groups, Roman Catholics particularly, that, that claim to be Christians, might be effective, but honest people would examine the Bible to see which group adheres to the Bible in order to see if we can refute what they teach, what the Bible truly teaches. That's what I'm going to defend, and that's what we defend in the churches of Christ. We follow the Bible and only the Bible. That's our only authority. We have no creed book. And so when we are studying it, this is what we request of them. Don't charge me with what the Roman Catholics have done or other groups have done. Methodists recently are now justifying homosexual marriages. It's an abomination to us for them to do that. We're so sad that they're doing it. But we're not defending that, that doctrine because the Bible definitely does not teach that. It teaches it's evil. So I'm not, I'm not going to even try to defend them. I deplore it just as much as the Muslim friends would deplore it. Christians, as set forth in the New Testament, oppose the drinking of alcohol except for reasons of health. We oppose the taking of drugs except for health. So we're not out there smoking pot. We're not justifying that. We're not justifying uh, drinking alcohol just for pleasure, to get drunk and so forth. But alcohol can be used as a medicine, both preventive and, and uh, curative. And drugs can be used that way too. But we're not, we, we don't believe you should go out, we believe it's a sin to go out and use them to get high. All sexual relations outside of marriage, we believe, are sinful. That's what we teach. So don't try to don't try to accuse us of, of fostering this free love problem in America because we preach against it. We teach that it's wrong as God's people. Immodest dress by either men or women, we oppose that. We we preach against that. We oppose homosexuality. We love the homosexuals, we don't love their actions. We try to convert them, to change them to change them into people who are not homosexual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there had been some who had been that, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, but now they had been washed and they're clean and they had ceased to commit this sin. So this can happen, but that's what we look for. We want to convert them. We want to change them to make them into Christians who would not be homosexuals because you can't be a Christian to be a homosexual. Because to be a Christian, you've got to be Christ-like. Christians oppose divorce except for fornication. That's what we oppose. Akuli wrote, fearing the police has taken the place of fearing God. That may be true, but it's not so with Christians because we fear God. 
and we'll give scripture for this. It's this is interesting because under Sharia law, it is fearing of the police that keeps people in check. It's not the fear of God, but it's the fear of the police. Now, if we look at this, the apostle Paul wrote, "Wherefore you must needs be in subjection, not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience' sake." He tells us to be in subjection to the civil government, not because we're afraid of them, but because our conscience tells us to do right. And he elaborates on this in the 13th chapter of Romans in some great detail. Christians are motivated by their love for others rather than their fear of the police, the civil government, as with Sharia. We are, we are motivated by our love. Christians' love for both God and men stops Christians from sinning. Look with me in Romans 13, verses 8 and following. We'll see. Oh, no man anything save to love one another. The, the Greek is real explicit here. If not, if not to love one another, this is the only thing you're to do. Our basic is a basic principle is love of God and love of our neighbor as ourselves. That's a summation of God's law. For he that loveth his neighbor hath fulfilled the law. Now he's talking about love and re re regards to our neighbor to various people, and it included the civil government. Our relation even to the civil government was one of love. Look at the next verse. For this, now he's going to explain what he's talking about. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. It's to be any other commandment to summed up in this word, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love, he summarizes now, worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. I'm reminded of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, chapter 22, sorry, verses 34 through 40, where he elaborated on this in some detail. But again, we don't have time to cover that as well. Akuli is right when he claims that the doctrine of original sin, he has a chapter on the doctrine of original sin. He claims it's not taught in the Bible in chapter 4 of his book. Well, I would endorse the vast majority of what he wrote in chapter 4 as being good material. And I would agree with him. Because I don't teach, and we don't teach, the Church of Christ don't teach original sin. The Roman Catholics do, see. But see, he's, he's attacking the biggest group, but not attacking those who hold to the Bible. The Bible clearly teaches that original sin, that is inherited depravity, is not true. So he is right. Now, there he does misunderstand a few passages in that chapter, but the bulk of what he wrote in chapter 4 of his book is correct. The bulk of it. There's a few times he kind of messes up on a few verses, but uh, he, he does argue pretty successfully that the doctrine of original sin is false doctrine. That, that is that the Bible doesn't teach it. Most of his arguments in chapter 4 are correct or sound. True Christians do not teach the doctrine of original sin. It's just not taught in the Bible because it's not in the Bible. Every person is guilty of his own sin and responsible for his or her own sin. Akuli is irrational to claim that if some certain commit certain sins, all must be guilty. You see, if I sin, you're not guilty. He has argued successfully in the chapter on, on original sin that each person has an individual responsibility and he does it well. And then he turns right around and accuses all Christians of being guilty because the non-Christians have committed, governments have committed sin. I'm not responsible for them unless I don't try to influence them correctly, don't try to teach them. When I try to teach them and they reject God's word, they are responsible for their own sins. And he's admitted that in this chapter that he's dealt with this. I find it so interesting that he just flip-flops back and forth and doesn't see that his claim that we ought to be responsible for the sins of others, of evil civil government, of those who have rejected religion, their evil sins, I, I'm not responsible for. Again, their, their view is the problem is they think Christianity is like Islam. It's a civil authority as well as religious. See, they're confusing it. They're comparing apples to oranges, as we say. He's guilty of the fallacy, logical fallacy of special pleading here, where they plead, treat me special. I get to make up my own rules. 
but not applying two sets of rules. Under Sharia, adulterers, homosexuals, and so forth are killed. Most of your Sharia will kill them. We do not know if those who do, who do not commit these acts are only refraining because of fear of police or for them, well, because of submission to God. Now, the Bible clearly teaches, even if I refrain from an act, if I have not submitted to God, if I'm just doing it out of fear, I haven't, I haven't gained anything. Yes, it's true, I didn't commit that sin, and that's good. But we must submit to God. We must obey God. Obedience takes the will of the person first. It's not just the action. It's the will first. True obedience, the will of the person is submitted. And then the person yields to the wishes of that other person. That's what submission is, obedience is, as is defined by the Greek and Hebrew words in both the Old and New Testaments. Islam does not appeal to the highest motivation. Love, as, as does the law of Moses and the New Testament. Keep this in mind. I've read through the Quran several times, and it just does not practice love to any great extent. Love is not a, a big factor as it is in the, in the Bible. Look, look with me and read with me in Matthew 22, verse 34 and follow. But the Pharisees, when they heard that he'd put the Sadducees to silence, he, he had uh, silenced the Sadducees with an argument, gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, trying him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the great first commandment. And the second, like it is this, I'm going to give you the second greatest commandment, he said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he says something very interesting. On these two commandments, the whole law hangeth in the prophets. In other words, the entirety of the law of, law of Moses, the Old Testament, the only scriptures they had at that time were the Old Testament, 39 books we call the Old Testament. That's all they had. And that's he encompasses all of it in that statement. That's what love is about. Obedience to those scriptures. The scriptures, the law and the prophets. It hangs on those two commandments. If you look at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, they can be classified. About four of them, I believe, are relations to God, are, are love relations to God. The other six are relation to our fellow man. And so we have we have these two categories. Yes, I understand. If I don't treat my fellow man right, I've sinned against God. I understand that. But some of the commandments directly relate, such as not murder, not kill, not bear false witness, and so forth. Clearly, a relation to people. Yes, yes, I'm sinning against God when I, when I do those things. But I'm also sinning against that person. The Bible condemns all sexual relations outside of marriage. And so he's, he's laid this upon us, that we're guilty of allowing this. Yes, we preach against this. Let marriage be had in honor among all, and let the bed be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So the Bible clearly teaches that that's the only place that sexual relations should ever occur, is in the marriage bed. Now, I'm not responsible, unless I commit the sin, for other people's sins. Now, if I encourage them to sin, I'm, I'm guilty. See? If I teach them that this is all right, and I guess some religious groups now that are claiming homosexual marriages are, are legitimate. The Methodist Church recently split over this very issue. Some contending it's not, shouldn't do it, shouldn't practice it, and others, now we're going to condone it, we're going to condone it and actually perform ceremonies. So they split. Well, I have taught, and I believe my brethren teach, I don't know any that don't teach this, uh, that it's sinful. We can't, we can't justify that in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So marriage is between a man and a woman. But let's look further. The Quran allows rape of slave girls and captive women. Now, a lot of people don't know this. Yusuf Ali's translation of Surah 424 says, also prohibited, that's prohibited, that you're prohibited to have 
to have sex with people, with a with woman, already married. That would be a Muslim woman. Except, see, why not do that exception? Except those whom your right hands possess. Oh, now who who is the woman that your right hand possesses? Thus hath Allah ordained prohibitions against you. Except for those, all others are lawful, provided you seek them in marriage. With gifts and with property, desiring chastity, not lust, seeing that you derive benefit from them, give them their dowers, at least as prescribed. But if, after the dower is prescribed, agree mutually to vary it, there is no blame on you and on all of it, all knowing all wise. But let's go back to the Who are those in your right hand? We're going to give other passages in the Quran to show that it's a captive woman, whether she's married or not, and that it's a slave girl. And so you can rape them. You can have sex with them, and they have no way of saying no. They can't say no. We'll prove that. This refers to captives and to slaves. All right? Now, Look carefully as we go through it. And Surah 424 also prohibited our women already married except those whom your right hands possess. They're, they're not to have sex with another Muslim's wife, but they can rape a married captive woman. This is Islamic ethics. This refers to captives and slaves. Now look at Surah 424. Uh, for use of Allah's translation, also prohibited are women already married except those that you in the right hands possess. These are captive women, slaves, both of them. Now, in chapter, in Surah 23, 1, the believers must eventually win through. In other words, they, they believe, they teach, that they're going to conquer the whole world eventually. And those who humble themselves in their prayers who avoid vain talk, who are active in deeds of charity, who abstain from sex except with those joined to them in the marriage bond, or the captive, see? So the captive is not joined to them in a marriage bond. You see it? Right here? Or the captive, okay. whom that are right in possess. For in their case, they are free from life. Their case with regard to the woman they're married to or the captives that they hold. So that any woman that is captured, she's fair game. That's exactly what they teach. That's what the Quran teaches. And those who guard their chastity except with their wives and the captive. This is Surah 7029, another one. Whom their right hands possess, for then they are not to be blamed. So there's no blame with a captive woman. And a captive woman would be a slave or a woman that you captured in battle. You overrun a town, you capture it. Now, if ISIS just raped women that weren't weren't uh, weren't Muslims when they took over. It was just the captives include captive women and slaves. I will give some more information. Even if a Muslim woman is raped, she will be stoned for adultery because her testimony is not equal to a man's testimony. It takes two women to equal one man's testimony by the Quran. The Muslim, I can prove it by the Quran. We don't have time to show it, but Surah 2, uh, 2 282 shows it. So when it goes to the court, you got to have two women to equal one man's testimony. So a man rapes a woman. All he has to do is say, she lured me, so she's an adulteress. He's free, and she's stoned. That happens in the Muslim countries. That is that is that is the ethics of Islam. If the man accuses the woman of luring him, his testimony is accepted, and she is then stoned under Sharia law. This is why Islam is what they teach and practice with regard to women. Furthermore, Akuli wrote, the major crimes of rape, robbery, forgery, and murder have become a horrible nightmare. Yes, we do have those problems in America. But the Quran Allows rape and the other group to the show, such as murder, when they, when they have the people that go in and bomb people and kill them, and they become a horrible nightmare. Yes, they, these things occur, but they occur in, under Islam too. 
But the fact is, Islam justifies the rape. And it justifies the murder. We can show that as well. From the Quran and the Hadith. The Bible condemns rape, but the Quran allows it. There's the difference. That's the difference between the true Christianity, the Christianity of the Bible, and the Quran and Islam. The Bible condemns all of these other things, other, other sins. So Christians, true Christians, don't practice these things. And we're not responsible for those who practice them who are not Christians. So, now, Muslims in America are not responsible for the, for the sins of non-Muslims, are they? They wouldn't say they are. But, of course, if they take over, then they must be responsible for them. But they'll kill them. So their, their way is to, to kill people who commit many of these sins. Pickthall's translation of it teaches that, and I've got three different translations, I want you to see this, because one of their responses, you, that you don't have a good translation of the Quran. Okay. But here's three different translations of this. The Quran teaches that men may beat their wives. They can beat them. Men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one of them to excel the other. Right? Women are second rate citizen and because they spend of their property for the sport of women so good women are the obedient guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded as for those with whom they you fear rebellion if you fear they're rebelling admonish them and banish them to, to beds apart and scourge them then if they obey you seek not to weigh against them lo Allah is ever high exalted great now that's Surah 434, Pictol's translation of it. Yusuf Ali's translation of that same passage says, Men are the protectors and maintainers of women, because Allah hath given the one more strength than the other, because they support them with their means. Therefore the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard, probably to remain faithful to the marriage. Right? And to those women of whose part you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first, next refuse to share their beds, and last beat them, and he put lightly in there. The other translation don't put lightly. But if they refuse return but if they return to obedience, seek not against the means of annoyance. For Allah is most high, great above all of you all. Now then we have another translation, Shakir's translation. Men are the maintainers of women because Allah hath made some of them to excel others because they spend out of their property. The good women are therefore obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah hath guarded. And as to that on whose part you fear desertion, admonish them and leave them alone in the sleeping place and beat them. Then if they obey you, do you, do you seek a way against them? Surely Allah is great, uh, high great. You see? Three different translations. One used scourging, one says beat, and it's put lightly in italics, and then beat them here. A Muslim man can beat his wife anytime he wants to. Now, the Quran says you're supposed to do it when you suspect, suspect them of doing wrong. That if you suspect them of doing wrong, if you read that, that those passages, you'll see it. This is Islam. It's not Christianity. Christianity doesn't teach that. Christianity condemns that kind of thing. Akuli falsely claims that Christians are not obligated to pray to God. He says, he wrote, No daily prayers are required. Just pray on Sunday only and then forget God to all the other days of the week. See how he misrepresents Christianity? We don't teach that. Not teach that at all. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Other passages tell us to pray. And I, I suspect everyone in this audience prays regularly, not just on Sunday. <laughs> it's not the only day we pray. We pray other times, every day. Other verses can be set for us regarding prayer, but we don't have time to do it. Again, that's a false accusation about what we teach and practice. Akuli wrote, they have accepted the church Christianity, that is, i.e., Christianity as preached by the church because it exempts them from almost all obligations. You see, his claim is you just got a real loose, easy way. But then he contradicts himself 
and we'll show that on the next slide. In fact, the New Testament places more stringent obligations on Christians than the Quran and Hadith do on Muslims. <laughs> Our regulations are more stringent than theirs are. I can't rape a woman. I can't because I'd be sinning. I couldn't do it. See? That would be sin. The Bible would tell me I'm lost. I can't, I can't go out and kill people. I can't do that. You see, again, we can show the nature of Christianity. Akuli contradicts the quote of the last slide when he wrote on page 90, even the ethics as presented by the Gospels is too ideal to be applicable. It's too ideal. It's too rigid. But he's turned around and said it's too easy. You see, he talks out of both sides of his mouth. I just, I, it's amazing. He says, love your enemies. Who does? Bless him that curse you. Who, do, who can? If slapped on one cheek, turn the other cheek. Slave-like education. It, gospel ethics are two ideals. See, again, right here, what we see is he, he turns around and contradicts himself. He said it's too easy, and then he said it's too hard. Can't have it both ways. We got a couple more slides we'll be through. Indeed, Jesus the Christ requires more of us than Islam does. Yes, he does. Akuli wrote, No gospel mentioned the mother of Jesus specifically as being among the witnesses of the crucifixion of her, or among the visitors at the tomb. Well, the fact that they're not, she's not mentioned, if if he were right, wouldn't prove it. She wasn't there. That's a logical fallacy. But uh, Acts 1.15 and John 19.26-27 shows she was. <laughs> so, and it's not even factually right. His argument commits the fallacy of denying the antecedent. We'll show this, his argument and we'll be through. If the Bible specifically mentions Mary witnessing his crucifixion, then Mary viewed his crucifixion. Then he argues the Bible does not specifically mention Mary witnessing his crucifixion. Well, first of all, this second premise is false. We just gave scripture to show it's false. But even if it were true, it still wouldn't prove what he's concluding because logically it doesn't follow. It's a fallacy called denying the antecedent. You can look on the internet and find examples of it for your own edification. Let me summarize it in the lesson of the years. Many Muslims view the Lord's Church through a monolithic lens. They think it is like Islam, both political and religious, which is not. The ethics of the New Testament are of a much higher level than the ethics of Islam. Some arguments made by Akuli are irrational, logically invalid. And some of his arguments are, in fact, not factually correct, as I just showed with regard to Mary viewing Jesus. She was at his crucifixion. We see that as we gave scripture for it. Thank you for your attention this morning.